Hello, and welcome to Trustee Talk. I'm your host, Michelle Beckham Corbin, and my guest today is Anderson Township Trustee President Peggy Rice. Peggy, it's so great to have you here today. Thank you, Michelle. It's always a pleasure to be here. And I know we have a lot of really interesting topics to talk about today. So um, let's just jump right in. I wonder if you could share with us and with our audience a little bit of information on um, what's happening with OKI, kind of an update from the OKI. Well, a lot of what's happening uh, with OKI is the topic of the uh, Bent Spence Bridge. And uh, that is OKI's number one priority, has been for quite some time. And uh, as you know, I sit on that executive committee at OKI, which is, if the public is not aware, it's the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana Council of Governments. And um, because I sit on the executive committee, we from time to time are given updates or presentations. And um, OKI is the um, major MPO for our region, which is a metro planning, metropolitan planning organization. So we were given um, a presentation by Mr. Jim Riley, and he is the deputy director uh, of ODOT, Ohio Department of Transportation. And he was explaining to us Ohio's efforts to finance the building of the new bridge. Now, it is a new bridge. It's not fixing the old bridge. It will augment um, the bridge that we have. But funding, as you might know, is a huge issue. Right. And so he's going into that. The bridge itself, um, it was built in 1963. And it is functionally completely obsolete. And as we all know, it is the major crossing and major crossing between the two states, Ohio and Kentucky. But there are other issues as well. There are safety issues. The lanes are extraordinarily narrow and dangerous. And especially today with so many large SUV type cars. Oh, it's amazing. And trucks. Well, at any rate, uh, he tried to outline what he thought, uh, or at least from ODOT's perspective, what a solution uh, might be. And some of the things that have already happened is that we've already passed legislation for Ohio, which is, which is by the way, the 30th state to enter into what we call a private-public partnership. So the law is now in place. They are creating a policy an organization um, from ODOT, and uh, we have a memo of understanding between the two states, Kentucky and Ohio, but the new twist is they are, they are producing a study which is called a conducting a value for the money study. They will be selecting advisors, and they will be um, they will be reviewing and researching finance options. So this is new. This value for the money. And I think what's new about it is that it transfers some of the risk, which typically has always been public risk, taxpayers' risk. Uh -huh. Risk. It transfers some of that and some of the responsibility for building the bridge to the private sector. Now the trick is to make it attractive to the pu public uh, sector as a um, as a as an investment. So we're getting away from what typically has financed infrastructure of this sort, mm -hmm. which has been gas tax, that sort of thing. That's the old method, and it's been um, it's been well publicized that the estimated cost for the bridge is $2.5 billion. <laughs> so billion? You said billion, billion, right? billion with a B. Wow. Um, and that would be more wow. than uh, a 10 years, 10 years of transportation budgeting for each state. So that's just an enormous amount of money to come up with. But there are some key factors for success. Uh, one is to build support and to build a coalition, not only between the states, but between the different partners. And it needs to be the right size project. We need better ideas, we need to ide identify opportunities, mitigate threats, and we need to investigate the tolling options. I know, 
No, I no, no. I, I was wondering <laughs> if that would be part oh, of yeah. it. Because you see that so much in, in big cities like Chicago, et cetera. Well, unfortunately, it's my opinion and those that I've spoken with, it's their opinion as well, that this bridge cannot be built without tolling. Uh, it will not be the sort of tolling that you and I, um, that I, at least I, have be become accustomed to where you stop and either pay an attendant or throw some money into a slot. No, no, that wouldn't work. First of all, there's too much traffic there, mm -hmm. and uh, it would slow things down. But uh, technology has come to the point where electronically they will be able to tag a vehicle that cro in some way crosses that bridge and then the vehicle or and or owner or whatever. I don't know the details, but I know that it will be an electronic tolling and um, that, uh, that that's going to be part of the financing. Yeah, kind of like the easy pass where you just pass through and it, it's picked up, that, that you've got your, your um, the pass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know about the passes, but I, I, did the, I did the run for the park district, you know, and they somehow knew who, who crossed the finish line. So I don't know if it's a little bit of the same thing or not, but um, the, uh, it's interesting. So tolling in some way will be a part of it. But we need to uh, show the benefits of doing it now, and and that's really the critical part. We can't wait another ten years for for this bridge. Right. Uh, and some of the benefits of doing it now, I'll tell you what they are. We can save nearly five hundred million dollars versus even doing it five or ten years from now. Five hundred million savings just by doing it now. Get it done. Gotcha. And the yield to the states uh, to the States will be $18.9 billion, so there's a benefit. You have to understand this is a major commerce corridor. Oh, it is, yeah. And it's claimed that it will reduce traffic by 80%. Why? Why? I don't know. Hmm. That's an engineer's estimate. But what I'd like to share with you now are some rather shocking statistics sure. about the bridge. And this was part of our presentation, so I, I brought this back to Anderson. You know, Michelle, we used to have this saying, and maybe it's still out there, I suspect, and we would always say, well, now you need to think glo globally, but act locally. Mm -hmm, you remember mm -hmm, that? Mm -hmm. So I think this is a good illustration of that, that we can't, we, we can't just be held in by our specific boundaries. We need to get out there and think how the region can benefit or how this particular project can influence um, our regional economy. Uh, concerning freight, four hundred and seventeen billion in freight crosses the bridge an annually. Wow, that's a lot of commerce. Four hundred and seventeen billion in freight, and we think of it as a crossing between Ohio and Kentucky, which it certainly is, but it really represents vital commerce um, connection to ten states. Because so they're just passing evolved. through, right, to go on to their final destination. Exactly. And every day, you, I don't know, I, I would never have come up with this. I mean, it's so much higher than I thought. 117, 172,000 motor vehicles cross daily. Every day. Wow. I know. I know. It's amazing. That's a lot for a bridge built in 1963. Uh, so you could see structurally and capacity-wise, I mean, it is more than double capacity of what it was designed for. Right, right. So it's, it's not even safe anymore. And then you're five times more likely to have a wreck on the bridge than on the interstate. So there's that huge safety feature again. And we had, um, I, I don't recall if it was that bridge or not, but there was that, that really bad accident last year where somebody fell it was, was that it bridge. Accident? Was it that bridge? Oh, oh yeah, it was that bridge. And uh, I mean, you could just imagine running out of gas or breaking down or whatever. It's it's uh, a nightmare. And 3.6 million hours of delay for cars annually. Mm -hmm. So this is getting to be gridlock as well. Mm -hmm. Just trying to pass over the bridge. That many million of hours in delay. And this I like, 1.6 million gallons of fuel wasted. That's how much fuel you, you waste. Sitting, kind of? Just sitting, 1.6 million gallons. Wow. Just sitting. And you can imagine what that does to air quality, emissions, and 
everything else. Right, right. So that's my update on OKI and, and, the, and the bridge. Those are some pretty sobering statistics. I know. You know, and, and I thank you, Peggy, for bringing that up because, you know, people might see or hear a little little tidbit of the story, but when they can come and tune in and, and really kind of get the bigger picture of why this is so needed, um, I think it'll really help them to understand, especially if we do run into a situation where there's any kind of, you know, tolls or, or payment to see how truly needed this is. So, well, let's bring us back into um, Anderson Township. I, I understand that Anderson Township is um, developing a new planning tool, and if you could tell us a little bit about what that is. Well, we are designing something, and it is still in the draft stage, but I believe that it will, um, it will be passed by the trustees, and I think it is going to be a marvelous new tool. And basically what, is, what it is, it's some design guidelines guidelines for design, which will help um, develop, uh, given to developers, re developers or redevelopers, and they will guide the appearance, the form, and the function, once again, for new development and redevelopment. This is in non-residential zoning districts. In other words, it doesn't take place in your neighborhood, but, you know, a business corridor, mm -hmm. Beach and Watt Avenue, that kind of thing. Okay. And what are some of the objectives? One of the objectives is to plan and design quality developments. Now, what is a quality development? But, uh, you know, I guess that is somewhat subjective, but these are, these are very detailed in the plan. And, you know, this should protect our property values and private investments as well. And as you know, property values and keeping them high has been a goal of mm -hmm. the Board of Trustees for a long time. We've talked about it in many ways. And, um, and so I think that that will happen. Another um, objective is to encourage mixed uses. This is something that uh, all planners dream about. <laughs> you know, not having just one function on a site, uh -huh. but... Um, is can you get residents tied into it? Can you do a little mix of office space, retail, whatever? That's that's really the ultimate and the consummate use in design. And it should pr provide value for those developing the property and the residents as well. Um, the guidelines will allow the application of performance standards. In other words, application of performance standards, meaning they will be measured. And so to this will mitigate any adverse impact on adjacent areas. Because uh, standards that, that are uniformly applied are a protection. And they're a protection for the neighborhoods, as well as those who are investing their money in the development. Mm -hmm. And the last goal and objective, I think, is to avoid piecemeal. With the, the absolute epitome of what we've seen in piecemeal is what happened on Beachmont Avenue decades ago. And, um, and that's very uh, fragmenting, but it'll give a stronger appearance to the development and to the community. And I believe that continuity gives a very, a much more pleasant appearance. Right, and it, it's really almost like branding. When you have some uniformity, especially when you're looking down, you know, down a community like down Beachmont Avenue, and you see some consistency, it just, it just looks better. It, yes, it just exactly. Does. Exactly. So, exactly. how will these guidelines be presented? Well, uh, the guidelines will be in a in a book or in a in a uh, planner or whatever, and they will be presented in chapters. There are five chapters. And within each of these chapters, there are many sub-chapters and sub-comments um, sub and categories. But the first chapter will be on site planning. That's what you have to consider most. What is your site? What is your property? And as you know, each property is unique, mm -hmm. and each property has its own um, amenities and challenges. So it, it's, it's not, um, that, that will be individual, the site planning. The next chapter will be on architecture, 
And of course, there are many subchapters under that, whether it's about building materials or the form of architecture or the color, but it will give them some kind of guidelines about you know what is expected. And probably some choices too. Well, right? yes. I mean, none of this is, we don't want any cookie cutter kind of thing because that's no fun and it, right. it would stifle uh, individuality. But um, but we, we want it to be quality and to right. look nice. Mm -hmm. Landscaping is always important and that's another chapter. And lots of things happen with landscaping. Um, you have to select the appropriate plants for, for the development in the site. And you can, you can design your landscaping so that um, parking areas can be softened, impervious surfaces can be softened. They could be pathways to direct people or vehicles, you know, uh -huh. th through the development. So landscaping, and that's fun. I mean, that's just a fun. Uh, right along with that is lighting. And lighting, uh, lighting, lighting's um, pretty good feeling about it, you know. The, the, the point there is to uh, have the lighting at appropriate levels, wise energy consumption, and to minimize something called uh, contributing to sky glow. Do you know what sky glow, glow is? No. Uh, I've seen it. Sky glow is if you're looking um, somehow in a, out of a distance, you can see the light going up into the sky above it. And that's not ideal. The ideal is to keep the light low and uh, not have it obscure our sky or our stars. That's interesting. <laughs> I, I like that, that term, sky glow. And if you're just tuning in, you happen to wander in on Trustee Talk. I'm host Michelle Beckham Corbin, and my guest today is Peggy Rice, and we are talking about sky glow and, and <laughs> also actually um, design standards for the township. So. That's a really interesting term. I'll have to Google that and kind of get some more background sky on glow. sky That's glow. <laughs> they're, the last, um, they're five, as I said, there were five chapters, uh -huh. and the last chapter will address um, our good old friend signage. And uh, signage can be tricky because everybody has their own concept. They want the what they want it to be bigger and who knows what or neon, <laughs> whatever they want. I don't know. But basically, signage is as a tool to give information. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and and direct information and di direction, but it can be very significant in the overall appearance of a roadway. So we'll give some guidelines on signage. Well, good. Now here here's the big question. These are wonderful guidelines. Um, is it mandatory? What happens if a business or developer comes in and and they don't want to abide by these chapters? Well. It's, it's not mandatory, and, and actually there would be no, um, no authority for us to, to, to make it manda mandatory. But I do pre believe that it will provide guidance to developers, to landowners, and here's the important thing, Michelle, it will give them that information er in the early stages of what they want to do. Before they totally be get into well, it. Well, before they, before they get into something that isn't appropriate or, you know, they've spent money on design or in engineering or whatever. And basically, it will, it, here's what it will do for them. It's going to answer the questions of what am I allowed to do and what is the township looking for? Mm -hmm. And once those two um, questions are answered, um, then they can move forward. And I, I, it's the type of thing, it's the type of thing, Michelle, where I don't think we're going to see immediate results from this, gui this guideline, but I think that down the, down the road, it will provide a framework for the future. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you will see it. And the, as I said before, the guidelines are not meant to stifle creativity. And, but in all situations, there's always many ways, individual as they may be, many ways to achieve what they want and what the township wants. Right, to have that individuality, but still to kind of be within some type of structure so that we keep the community looking really good. Exactly. Great. Well, you know, um, there was a survey done not too long ago, and it was all about um, the Greater Anderson Days um, Festival that we have mm -hmm. every year. And we'd love to be able to uh, hear what kind of results you got from that questionnaire. Well, um, 
I, I would like to give some of those results because uh, I, I believe that people take this survey, this questionnaire, year after year as they visit the festival, and uh, they, they don't know, well, what have they done with that? You know, I've been filling this out for years. What are they doing? So I thought I'd give some, some of at least this year's results. And it was started in 1999, and it is used as a tool for the township trustees and staff to understand what the, what the residents are thinking, what their preferences are. This year we had 292 um, surveys collected versus 298. So that's close. Uh -huh, yeah. But Friday night, if you remember, excuse me, it's a three-day festival. Right. And so Friday night there was a storm move in, and I was a little surprised we had as many as we did. But Yeah, I, I don't think people really like to fill things out when they get kind of soggy. <laughs> no, but we, that, was a very, that was a very respectable number to collect, uh -huh. almost 300. And one of the questions we asked was, was whether the residents are interested in participating in electric aggregation. And 59% said they were interested in, in joining. And I was surprised that it was that high because we didn't explain electric ag ag aggregation and say what we were going to do. And you actually, know. I was going to ask you, I have no clue what that is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, electric aggregation is where uh, a person and or a community can buy their electric power from a vendor of their choice. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, we are, we were going to do this anyway, but that 59% certainly, you know, substantiates our, our interest in this. And we can, we can go out and collect bids from various suppliers of electricity mm -hmm. and lock in a price. Now, the resident has the choice of participating in, the, in our price or... Uh, if they have a lower price, they certainly may keep it. But it gives, I think, an option. And I think that we will be able, as a township, to negotiate for our residents a lower price uh, for electricity than they might be able to get on their own. Right, because you've got, you've got the numbers with you, kind of the bulk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was the one, one question. Then we ask about whether the residents were interested in changing the zoning for chickens or bees. Now, I know, doesn't that sound silly? But that came out of the fact that we're not against chicken or bees, and we permit them, of course. What do what, what you do? But, <laughs> I was going to say, I there know. are bees in my backyard this summer. So. <laughs> Get rid of those bees. No, um, no but what, where, the, where the zoning restrictions apply is, um, is where they, they, they are contained as far as setback, or where on the property you have your chicken coop or your bee. The official kitchen. bee people that yeah. actually have hives and not just the bees that are kind of right. swinging by. Exactly. Okay. Gotcha. But this came out of the fact that um, a woman came to our public meeting and spoke to us, and she said that she had chickens, and she wanted a little bit more leniency for her chicken coop. Anyway, we asked the question, and here's the, here's the answer. 43% of the residents said no, they didn't want any zoning changes. 46 said yes, so there you go. Yeah. And 11% said they were unsure, which I guess is the swing vote in this case. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Oh. <laughs> and we asked about... Um, we asked about whether people were interested in joining the senior center, and 67% said yes, and I think that's higher than we've seen in the past. And I, I'm really quite pleased about that because it's such a marvelous facility for all our residents. And maybe it just means that the baby boomers are out there, and sometimes people call it the silver tsunami. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it also could be awareness, too, because they do wonderful programming for they people do. of any age. You know, and, and that's just a jewel to have in the community. Um, recycling, I'm, I must admit, uh, we still have 47% who do not use our recycling center. However, I do know that curb light, curb, curbside uh -huh. recycling is very popular. Well, and also with Rumpke moved to the, the large containers instead yes. of just the red totes. So I think that, that really helps, too. Right. We asked them if they felt safe in Anderson, whether they in their home, mm -hmm. shopping, playing in Anderson. 
97.7% said yes, I feel that, safe. Now that is, that is a great number. I mean, I that's like 98% of our residents feel safe here. Exactly. And we ask about events. Uh, the top three popular events were the 4th of July parade, parties on the plaza, farmer's market. But all the other events were very, very close. There wasn't any one that just dropped off as if you'd say, well, I don't want to never go to that again, uh -huh, you uh -huh. know? Yeah, that's good. So that was good. We, you'll be interested in this, and so will the producer here. We ask about watching Anderson Community Television. 60% mm -hmm. said they never watched it. Now, I don't know what that tells us exactly, except maybe we should do a little bit more promoting, a little bit more education, or show them the different convenient ways to watch ACTV? I think those are both really good ideas, kind of raising awareness that it does exist, and the fact that you don't have to tune in at you know 8 p.m. on Wednesday. Exactly. That, yeah, there's on demand, and you can go to the website and see some shows as well. So yeah, I think that that's, that was a great question to have in there. Yes, it's educational. I was pleased to, uh, pleased to say that of those who do watch ACTV, 40% um, watch the government meeting program. There you go. <laughs> we must be doing a good job. That's right. So that, that, that was fun to share the results. Yeah, and I, I think a, a great thing for, for our viewers at home to hear, too. We literally just have two minutes left. Can you tell us maybe really quickly a little bit about improvements to the Heritage Center? That's important because, as you know, um, the township has taken over managing and booking the Heritage Center, which is a treasure uh, from our bicentennial built in 1830. I didn't realize it was that old. 1830, 182 years old, and um, it is being spruced up. We are, we are applying for a grant, which I feel confident we will receive, and the furniture is being reupholstered, painting, and uh, it's very, very popular. And, we're booking weddings and meetings, and so bottom line is it's we're giving it just what your property and mine needs, you know, sprucing it up sprucing and fixing it up. It up. Yeah. Well, that's great because I belonged to a group um, years ago, and, and we had several events there um, in the, I wouldn't even say which decade. We had several events there, <laughs> and it was just a, a gorgeous place then, and it, yeah. it's nice that it's, it's getting um, kind of a, a redo, so... Well, great. This was wonderful information. I absolutely always love talking to you, Peggy, because you really, um, you know, not only share um, great things that are happening in the township, but you really provide a lot of insight from your vast experience um, in working in the community. So thank you again for being here today. My pleasure. And I wanted to thank you viewers for tuning in to this edition of Trustee Talk. And uh, Peggy and I both wish you all very happy holidays, and we will see you on our next show. Thanks a lot. Thank you.